So, so far in this uh, rather long and uh, fairly complicated chapter on machinery, I suggested you might want to keep in mind two things. One is uh, those conceptual elements in the footnote which bring together in some kind of ensemble the idea of technology, relation to nature, the processes of production, the sustaining of daily life, the social relations and mental conceptions, and try to look at how those elements combine in this account uh, to try to give you some sort of idea of how machinery and large-scale industry uh, is working. The other thing I suggested was that you should pay attention to the chapter or, or section headings because they give you a good guide as to uh, what Marx is about, and so far we've looked at the general way in which capitalism found its unique and special technological basis uh, by transforming a world of handicrafts and manufacturing into a world which is made up of the production of machines by machines and also uh, a factory system. Uh, but one of the things that differentiates machinery from cooperation and divisions of labor as ways of generating relative surplus value is that you have to pay for a machine, it is a commodity, so that immediately raises the question of how does the value incorporated in the machine get incorporated in the product, and Marx uses a straight line depreciation model which says, well, if a machine lasts ten years, then one tenth of its value passes on into the product every year, every year. But then out of that came a very important limitation on utilization of machines, which is going to crop up periodically throughout the rest of capital, which is the idea that the labor embodied in the machine should not be greater than the labor you save by it. Otherwise it doesn't make sense uh, to actually produce the machine or use the machine. Which then also suggests that if there are differentiations in the value of labor power from one place to another, then the machine dynamic is likely to be very different. And Marx uses the example of uh, the United States where there's a relative scarcity of labor and the value of labor was relatively high compared to Britain, so that machinery that was, entered, was invented in Britain gets uh, utilized in the United States. Uh, a more contemporary version of this, which I don't think I mentioned when we were looking at this section, would be one of the arguments about, about why West Germany was so technologically dynamic during the 1980s, 1970s and 1980s was because of strong labor unions which kept the cost of labor relatively high and in response to that the capitalists innovated very rapidly uh, with the result that they threw a lot of people out of work so Germany ended up with a high paid wage force but also a high level of structural unemployment uh, at the end of this as a result of this kind of uh, dynamic. So we have contemporary examples of this sort of, uh, this sort of issue. And then in the third section he asks the question, well what does this mean for labor? Uh, and what this means is first of all the substitution of the family wage for the individual wage, which has all kinds of repercussions for how family labor is organized, how the labor of women, children, uh, and that gets organized, how the gang system gets structured, how uh, sort of patriarchal systems within uh, the working class get deployed and, and reinforced through these kinds of, these kinds of mechanisms. The second uh, thing that's uh, very important uh, in, in, Marx's, in Marx's view is the way in which uh, the laborer uh, is caught up in this machine world by a very peculiar term which I've never quite understood why Marx used, which is the moral depreciation of machinery, which really amounts to the accelerated obsolescence of machinery because new machinery is coming online, which means that capitalists have an incredible incentive uh, to actually get their money back out of the machine as fast as they can, which means ex extending the length of the working day, keeping the machinery employed 24 hours a day, uh, and, and the like. And the final uh, point which Marx makes here is that, of course, machinery insofar as the pace of the work is now controlled by machine technology, uh, machinery becomes a, a major weapon for increasing the intensity of labor. Uh, because the intensity is no longer under the control of the laborer, but is under the control of those people who are 
uh, regulating uh, the machine. This brings him in the next chapter, which we are looking at now, uh, to the question of the factory system. And he summarizes a little bit uh, the argument uh, in the last three sections and then points out to two ways in which you can think of the factory system, as given by uh, Dr. Ewer, who was one of the chief ideologists of, of capitalism in the early 19th century, <coughs> in which there is this idea that it's a combined cooperation of many, many workers. Uh, and, and Marx contrasts that with the other interpretation, which Marx is going to follow, which is that really the factory is a vast automaton composed of various mechanical and intellectual organs acting in uninterrupted concert for the production of a common object, all of them being subordinate to a self-regulated moving force. Now, in what follows then, Marx is going to largely take that line of argument and point out that first off, the skill which the laborer once had as their own skill is now incorporated in the, s in the machine. So you get something called de-skilling. There's been a big debate in the literature of Harry Braverman and others about to the degree to which de-skilling continues to be a significant aspect of how capitalist uh, economies works. But what Marx is kind of saying is the skill goes inside the machine, therefore the laborer is, def is, is, is deprived of control over that skill. And this, of course, disrupts the divisions, the typical divisions of labor that occurred under the manufacturing, in the manufacturing period, and uh, turns division of labor into, as he says, essential, the essential division is that between workers who are actually employed on the machines and those who merely attend them, that is, feed them with raw materials and, and all the rest of it, uh, so that the, this de-skilling really completely reorganizes social relations within labor itself, except, as he says, that right at the bottom of 545, there is a superior class of workers, in part scientifically educated, in part trained in a handicraft. They stand outside the realm of the factory workers and are added to them only to make up an aggregate. That is, for that group, there is a certain reskilling that's going on, which is about you know, being the engineers, being the engineers of the assembly lines and, and, and all the rest of it. The impact on the laborer then is to transform the laborer from a lifetime of being involved with a particular skill, handling the same tool, into a lifetime of being attached to the same machine. And at the same time the laborer can't escape that, they're, 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 they're brought into it, which leads on 548 to, I think, what is the key uh, social critique, which he's going to introduce in this chapter, when he kind of says, well, uh, in handicrafts and manufacture, the worker makes use of a tool. In the factory, the machine makes use of him. And in the factory, we have a lifeless mechanism which is independent of the workers who are incorporated into it as its living appendages. The workers become appendages of the machines. And this then goes on to sort of talk about what the implications of that are, when he says, factory work exhausts the nervous system to the uttermost, at the same time it does away with the many-sided play of the muscles and confiscates every atom of freedom, both in bodily and in intellectual activity. The kind of work you're now doing is deprived of any content. Furthermore, as you go on down the bottom of the page, he talks about another very important aspect, the separation of the intellectual faculties of the production process from the manual labor. And the transformation of those faculties, i.e. the intellectual faculties, into powers exercised by capital over labor. And he, he says, we've seen elements of this going on before, but here we see it finally completed by large-scale industry. Uh, and he says, the special skill of each individual machine operator who has now been deprived of all significance vanishes as an infinitesimal quantity in the face of the science read mental conceptions, the gigantic natural forces, and the mass of social labor embodied in the system of machinery which, together with these three forces, constitute the power of the master. That is, capital has taken over skill, incorporated that in the machine, has taken over intellectual capacities and utilized those to its own advantage, has taken over science uh, and, and, and using that to its own advantage, and these all become powers are appropriated powers by which capital uh, can, dominate, can dominate labor. 
and to that is then added a disciplinary apparatus. And right at the end, Marx makes a lot of the system of fines and so on. There's a long footnote on page 550 to 551, footnote 9, which is worth reading about the way in which you know, capitalists actually organize uh, the disciplinary apparatus, uh, both in the work process and outside the work process, to make absolutely sure uh, that the worker uh, is uh, both disciplined, but then also uses that disciplinary apparatus to try to actually regain some of the value they pay out in wage labor. That is, if you find people for being late, and you, then you have somebody actually put the clock wrong, so everybody's late, then actually you find them so that they no longer get the wages that were really due to them. And this is one of the sort of tactics and tricks that uh, capitalists play with that sort of thing. So he ends favorably quoting Fourier for a change, uh, and Fourier's description of factories as really just mitigated jails. Now this all leads to, well, immediately into the next section, which is, if this is what's going on to the laborer, then you would expect some, la la some response. And the response we're going to look at in section 5 is the Luddite response, which is a political movement which was about machine breaking destroying the machines. And there are good reasons for doing that, and Marx outlines some of these, that of course the machinery is displacing wa wage labor so that people are thrown out of uh, jobs. Uh, they become, as he says uh, on 537, a worker becomes unsaleable, like paper money thrown out of currency by legal enactment. Uh, the disciplinary apparatus inside of the, of, of the factory is really sort of uh, troublesome because of the way in which machinery gets used. Uh, and so we get a description here then of uh, the Luddite movement, and furthermore, back up on 562, 563, he outlines one other element in, in, in the story when he says, Machinery does not just act as a superior competitor to the worker, always on the point of making him superfluous. It is a power inimical to him, and capital proclaims this fact loudly and deliberately, as well as making use of it. It is the most powerful weapon for suppressing strikes, those periodic revolts of the working class against the autocracy of capital." And he then says on top of 563, it would be possible to write a whole history of the inventions made since 1830, for the sole purpose of providing capital with weapons against working class revolt. So machinery is actually constructed very much in the minds of capital as a weapon of class struggle. Workers are getting uppity, introduce machines, it disciplines them, throws them out of work, uh, disrupts them, generates insecurity, all of those kinds of things. So technological change is not simply about gaining surplus value from uh, the relative surplus value that comes from, from that, it's also about disciplining the, the workers. And actually uh, there are, there's plenty of evidence, particularly in the 19th century, that this was a conscious idea. Uh, uh, a, uh, a machine manufacturer in, uh, in Paris in the sort of 1860s, when asked the question, uh, what, are, what are the things that drive you to, to innovate? He said uh, three things, increased efficiency, increasing output, and increasing discipline of the labor force. And of those three, the third was probably the most important for him. So that this question of machinery as a weapon in class struggle becomes actually absolutely central. So in a sense the struggle of the worker against the machine and the fight against the machine becomes understandable. But there's an interesting wrinkle, and so I want to go back here to when Marx first introduces the Luddite movement uh, at the bottom of 554, because there's a, an interesting kind of question that, uh, that this poses. <coughs> Having introduced the Luddite movement, what Marx does is to make the following comment. It took both, both time and experience before the workers learned to distinguish between machinery and its employment by capital, and therefore to transfer their attacks from the material instruments of production to the form of society which utilizes those instruments. Now, there's an interesting kind of question here. 
and it's important to think how we might read this. Does this imply that the machinery is itself neutral, and that what really matters is the social relations behind the use of the machine? And there is evidence, constructed by many social and economic historians of this period in Britain and of the Luddite movement, that indeed the Luddites started off by breaking almost any machine they found, to going after and targeting specific capitalists who were using them in a particularly obnoxious and brutal way. So there is considerable evidence that Marx is correct in saying that workers at that time learned to distinguish between just all the machines being, being deployed and specific horrendous utilization of those machines by specific capitalists. And the, and the targeting largely, over time, converged on those specific capitalists who were using it in the most obnoxious fashion. But then think about this for a moment, and, and worry a little bit about what this might in general imply. When Lenin came in and the uh, Bolshevik rev Revolution occurred, Lenin basically said, well, the Fordist factory is fine. There's nothing wrong with the Fordist factory. Mass production is fine. We need it, because we need to produce the arms which are going to defend ourselves and all the rest of it. What all that really matters is that the social relations change. So in a sense, Lenin was arguing that the machines were kind of socially neutral. And there is in fact a long history within Marxism, for example, as treating machines as good things. All that you have to do is get the social relations behind them right, and everything is fine. This does not really converge very well with the argument that I was making about how to think about that footnote. That footnote would imply that in exactly the same way that capitalism had to find a technological basis for itself, so indeed socialism, communism, would have to find a new technological basis for itself, which would in fact be radically different from that that had been derived under capitalism, as different from that which Marx is here describing as this is from the manufacturing era. In other words, the long-run concern would be not to treat the technology as neutral, but to treat it as embodying, in many respects, certain ideas about the relation to nature, certain mental conceptions, certain social relations, and all the rest of it. And that a transformation of all of those elements would require a radical change in the trajectory of technological development. But that was certainly not what Lenin did. And when Lenin looked to Fordism and praised the Fordist system, as being a great invention which the Soviets would have to emulate, you could argue that he's going the wrong way unless, unless you took the view, which Marx does, that you cannot change a society without utilizing all of the elements that are already there. And exactly the same way that capitalists had to use the technologies of the manufacturing period, so there's absolutely no way that in a condition of revolution, such as 1917 in the Soviet Union, in a condition of that sort, you had no option except to utilize capitalist technologies. Particularly since capitalism is breathing down your neck and trying to invade you with all kinds of sophisticated arms and technologies and all the rest of it, you have no option. But that's a very different way of looking at it than looking at the it as a long-term perspective. And there are certain ways in which a Marxist reading of this argument, which turns technology into something neutral, actually can then lead you into many of the problems of actually existing socialism or communism as we've, they emerged in the sort of 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, labor processes that in many ways were indistinguishable from what you would find in Detroit, uh, conditions of labor and repression actually that were not much different than you would find in Detroit. And so that this question, I think, about how to read this passage becomes very important. 
I would read it against the background of those footnotes. But there's a lot of Marxist reading of this that would, would actually kind of take on a rather Promethean view of technology and a Promethean view of all of this and kind of say, well, this is the basis, this technology is the basis, all we have to do is to make it super efficient and make sure the social relations behind it are adequate uh, to, to uh, justify uh, this technology. The big problem is that the social relations that are necessary for to, to manage these kinds of technological systems are hierarchical systems, are you know, command and control systems and all the rest of it, which are not necessarily uh, democratic uh, systems. So, you know, these are the sorts of issues that this, uh, this, this just this little phrase here uh, actually sets up, which is carried over actually into the next section. Section 6 on the compensation theory, which starts on 565. Now, the bourgeois political economists maintained that the development of machinery was neutral. Again, this is a neutrality assumption. It was neutral in relationship to total aggregate labor employment. They accepted there were disruptions of, you know, moving from here to there and everywhere else, but in aggregate, the compensation theory said for every job you lose because machines are employed, you're going to get a job back somewhere else. And this compensation was understood as being one-on-one, -on -one in aggregate. And as, as Marx kind of points out, you find all kinds of people peddling this idea, Mill, McCulloch, Torren Sr. and John Stuart Mill, but you'll notice in the footnote he says of Ricardo that Ricardo originally shared this view but afterwards expressly disclaimed it with the scientific impartiality and love of truth characteristic of him. <laughs> Very rare that you find Marx kind of saying nice things about bourgeois e economists, but he was, as I've mentioned, seriously admiring of Ricardo and seriously admiring also of Adam Smith, who were very, very different from, uh, you know, Nassau Senior and, 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 and all of the, the crass apologists and so on. Now, what Marx does, of course, is to immediately dismiss this whole kind of line of argument, um, and he points out that, that actually there's a very peculiar way in which they're making the argument, which is that by throwing people out of work, you've saved on, on the subsistence they otherwise would have consumed. So there's a lot more subsistence available in, in society, and all kinds of crazy ways in which they argued this, this, this neutrality thing. And, he goes on and says himself, well, okay, the real facts on 567 are these. Uh, the workers, when driven out of the workshop by the machinery, are thrown onto the labor market. Their presence in the labor market increases the number of labor powers which are at the disposal of capitalist exploitation. A bit further down. He says, I'm going to deal with this later on, and he does in great depth. Workers who have been thrown out of work in a given branch of industry can no doubt look for employment in another branch. If they find it, and thus renew the bond between them and the means of subsistence, this takes place only through the agency of a new additional capital, which is seeking investment, and in no way through the agency of the capital which was already functioning previously and was then converted into machinery. So the conversion into machinery has nothing to do with it. It's just that added capital is coming in and mopping up the surplus labor. But then he goes on to say, even if they do find employment, what a miserable prospect! Crippled as they are by the division of labor, these poor devils are worth so little outside their old trade that they cannot find admission into any industries except a few inferior and therefore oversupplied and underpaid branches. As soon as machinery has set free a part of the workers employed in a given branch of industry, the reserve men are also diverted into new channels of employment and become absorbed into, in other branches. Meanwhile, the original victims during the period of transition, for the most part, starve and perish. It is an undoubted fact that machinery is not as such responsible for setting free the worker from the means of subsistence. It cheapens and increases production in the branch it seizes on, and at first leaves unaltered the quantity of the means of subsistence produced in other branches. Hence, after the introduction of machinery, society possesses 
as much of the necessaries of life as before, if not more, for the workers who have been displaced, not to mention the enormous share of the annual product wasted by non-workers. And this is the point relied on by our economic apologists. The contradictions and antagonisms inseparable from the capitalist application of machinery do not exist, they say, because they do not arise out of machinery as such, but out of its capitalist application. Therefore, since machinery is itself, in itself shortens the hours of labour, but when employed by capital it lengthens them, since in itself it lightens labour, but when employed by capital it heightens its intensity, since in itself is a victory of man over the forces of nature, but in the hands of capital it makes man the slave of those forces, since in itself it increases the wealth of the producers, but in the hands of capital it makes them into paupers, the bourgeois economist simply states that the contemplation of machinery in itself demonstrates with exactitude that all these evident contradictions are a mere semblance, present in everyday reality. Thus he manages to avoid racking his brains any more, and in addition implies that his opponent is guilty of the stupidity of contending not against the capitalist application of machinery, but against machinery itself. Now, again, we're getting this whole discussion and debate over whether it's machinery or the capitalist application of machinery that is the problem. And here he's kind of using the bourgeois defence of the deployment of machinery as being neutral, in order to actually highlight where we should be thinking about the social relations. But does this mean that indeed the, cap the, the machinery is neutral? in itself. This is, again, as you can see, where one of the problems starts to arise, and we'll get to discuss that uh, a bit later. In other words, machinery, when you look at the last two sections, has been very much about managing the labour surplus, and managing the supply of labour. But he then goes on on 570 to raise the issue and say, well, it doesn't automatically mean that the labour surplus remains unemployed. In fact, the generating of a labour surplus by throwing people out of work creates all kinds of possibilities for new capital investment to come in and mop up that labour surplus. So on 570 he starts to talk about the way in which uh, having people thrown out of work may bring about an increase in employment in other industries. But he says this has nothing to do with any kind of theory of compensation, it has to do with whether there is investment capital out there looking for surplus labour. And if it is, you can get a massive increase of uh, employment simply because capitalism is itself is being very dynamic. And one of the ways in which it can be dynamic is because an increase in technology in one sector can put tremendous demands on the flow of raw materials from elsewhere. So about towards the bottom of 570 he says, the production of raw material must be quadrupled. You know, if you've got machine now uh, uh, producing uh, four times as much cloth as, as before, then you need four, four times as much in the way of raw material, and that means a lot of employment in those kinds of segments. But he then says, on 570, at the bottom, how far employment is thereby found for an increased numbers, number of workers depends, given the length of the working day and the intensity of labour, on the composition of capital employed. The composition of capital is the ratio of constant to variable capital, a very important concept which Marx is going to use throughout capital, uh, and, and therefore he's introducing it here uh, for the first time. It's really a measure of labour intensity or capital intensity, if you like. That capital intensive industries are going to demand less labour, labour intensive industries are going to demand, demand more labour. So it's the intensity of the capital labour ratio which is crucial he says, for whether actually people do get an increase of employment. So there is a possible increase of proletariat, 
bottom of 572, he introduces another problem, which is by and large ignored in Volume 1 of Capital, and, and I'm going to emphasize it because it's an important problem which is not going to be analyzed elsewhere, but typical Marx, he introduces it uh, and says, well, you need, you need to think about it. Actually, it's going to be the topic of Vols 2 and Vols 3, so, but, but here he, it, it comes in. You don't only got to think about how the labor surplus is going to be managed, so you've always got a, a labor supply, you've also got to think about where on earth are you going to dispose of that, of the commodity surplus which you produce? Where's the market for your surplus value going to go? Where is that market? Who's going to consume all this excess of, of production? Let's suppose you've introduced new machinery and you've got so much more cloth coming out and so many more shirts and so on, all these kinds of things, and it's, it's quadrupled. Who's going to buy it all? Clearly the workers are not really in a position to buy it, because they're being exploited like crazy, so who's going to buy it? So he introduces this issue very briefly on the bottom of 572. He says, the immediate result of machinery is to augment surplus value and the mass of products, the mass of commodities, in which surplus value is embodied. It also increases the quantity of substances for the capitalists and their dependents to consume, and therefore the size of these social strata themselves. Increase of capitalist class, increasing capitalist consumption. Their growing wealth, he says, and the relatively diminished numbers of workers required to produce the means of subsistence begets both new luxury requirements and the means of satisfying them. A larger proportion of the social product is converted into surplus product, and a larger portion of the surplus product is reproduced and consumed in a multitude of refined shapes. In other words, the production of luxuries increases. Then he introduces foreign trade and relations with the world market. Here too, you have a way of engaging with where the surplus is going to go, which of course increases the demand for labor in the transport industry and, and the like. So foreign trade, spatial relations, geographical expansion gets put on the agenda. Next passage. Well, you can also put some of the surplus into long-term capital projects which don't produce anything for many, many years. It says, extensions of work that can only bear fruit in the distant future, so construction of canals, docks, tunnels, bridges, and so on. And he then talks about a whole series of industries which are engaged in that sort of thing, gasworks, telegraphy, photography, steam navigation, and railways. So there's a lot of what I would call both temporal and spatial displacement of the consumption of the surplus going on here. And finally, on 574, he introduces the idea of services. And on 574 he also produ produces uh, ideas about uh, a servant class. It is possible to reproduce the ancient domestic slaves on a constantly extending stale, scale under the name of a servant class, including men servants, women servants. And then, of course, there are the ideological groups, members of government, priests, lawyers, soldiers, all the people exclusively occupied in consuming the labor of others in the form of ground rent, interest, etc. Paupers, vagabonds, and criminals have something to do with it too. But notice something here. Look at that at the bottom of that page, how large the servant class is. It's huge. Now we sometimes say to ourselves, oh well, you know, recently capitalism has gone into services. Well, of course, the difference here was the servant class was in-house. We now live in a world where services are commodified, you buy them in the market. You know, the famous kinds of lines that were going on in the 1930s, you can't get good nannies and personnel anymore, can't get good servants anymore, so you have to take it outside. You know, you go out and get your, your washings done outside, your pressings done outside, all the services are taken outside. But the point here is that 
the structure of class relations, look at that servant class. It's huge. Marx does not have much to say about it. He doesn't have much to say about any of these issues here at all. But what that servant class was about, and how it was working, and what its conditions of labour were, is actually a very important topic, which I think is only now begin, beginning to be unravelled by uh, social and uh, economic uh, historians. But again, the point here is that there are the implications of this, this system, this machine system, are huge both for the management of the labour surplus, uh, but also the management of the disposal of the surplus into world markets. And this is an issue, like I say, that he doesn't deal with uh, throughout Volume 1 of Capital, but it becomes important elsewhere. This is the one part where he, he does explicitly mention it as uh, an issue. Section 7, long section about, as its title says, Repulsion and Attraction of Workers Through the Development of Machine Production Crises in the Cotton Industry. Even bourgeois economists, political economists at the time, realized that there were transitional problems. When people were thrown out of work here, they had to find work there. And these transitional problems meant that there were certain kind of cyclical movements in industries. Um, I'm not going to go through this chapter in any great, this section in any great detail, because it really is this about the inflow and outflow of, 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 of people, mainly in the cotton industry. Uh, but there are a couple of interesting points. The first is at the bottom of 579. Well, the top of 579, when he talks about uh, as soon as the factory system has attained a reasonable space to exist in, and reached a definite degree of maturity, and in particular, as soon as the technical base is peculiar to it, machinery is itself produced by machinery. And then he goes on, in short, as soon as the general conditions of production appropriate to large-scale industry have been established, this mode of production acquires an elasticity, a capacity for sudden extension by leaps and bounds, which comes up against no barriers but those presented by the availability of raw materials and the extent of sales outlets. In relation to nature, raw materials, sales outlets, the consumer economy. But out of this comes also, right at the bottom of the page, a new and international division of labour springs up, one suited to the requirements of the main industrial countries, and it converts one part of the globe into a chiefly agricultural field of production for supplying the other part, which remains a preeminently industrial field, which of course is what the British were doing to India. India was pr providing the raw materials, and at the same time India was the market for British goods, so the whole imperialist project was to turn India into a field for the production of raw materials for British industry, and then use India as a sink for uh, British products. This leads into this, what he says, this, in a way, a kind of a, a temporal business cycle that there are rapid fluctuations, and much more volatility gets introduced into the system. And it's kind of funny, given the current state of volatility in global markets, to find Marx actually emphasizing that volatility is very much what capitalism is always about. It expands by leaps and bounds, and then kind of goes crash, and then turns back and kind of then expands again. And, as he says, uh, the factory system's tremendous capacity for expanding with sudden immense leaps and its dependence on the world market necessarily give rise to the following cycle. Feverish production, a consequent glut on the market, then a contraction of the market which causes production to be crippled. The life of industry becomes a series of periods of moderate activity, prosperity, overproduction, crisis and stagnation. Marx is here talking about what he sees as the production of the business cycle. And some of these are, are long term. But these business cycles have implications for labour, which is what he's talking about in the cotton industry for the next 10, 15 pages. Uh, and I think that this is a very important 
uh, aspect of the dynamic of machinery uh, which differentiates uh, the industrial system from the system that preceded it. Handicrafts and, and modern in handicrafts and manufacturing system was much less, uh, could, could not move as quickly, couldn't throw people out of work. There was too much monopoly power in the labor sector uh, to do that. But here you can just throw people out of work, bring them back in. They're all machine minders anyway. You don't care about their skills too much. Just get them, throw them out and bring them back in. So that's the way in which uh, a rather callous industrial system uh, go, uh, works, works. Now in section 8, he talks about the revolutionary impact of large-scale industry on manufacture, handicrafts, and domestic industries. Again, I'm not going to go through this in too much detail, because the main story is to, is to set up the factory system as against these other manufacturing systems. Clearly, in his period of time, the, the manufacturing system was still present. The handicraft system was still present. The domestic system of manufacture was still present. And in fact, in some, in some respects, they had become even more sophisticated than they had been in the periods when they were dominant. Partly because that was the only way in which they could maintain themselves and maintain their systems in relationship to this overpowering factory system that was coming into being. Um, and on 590, he makes, I think, a th a, some very interesting remarks about this. The principle of machine production, he says, namely the division of the production process into its constituent phases and the solution of the problems arising from this by the application of me mechanics, chemistry, and the whole range of natural sciences, now plays the determining role everywhere. It even gets applied to the modern domestic industry, and he then goes on to say, this modern domestic industry, at the bottom of the page, has nothing except the name in common with the old-fashioned domestic indus industry, the existence of which presupposes independent urban handicrafts, independent peasant farming, and above all a dwelling house for the worker and his family. That kind of industry is now being converted into an external department of the factory, the manufacturing workshop or the warehouse. Besides the factory worker, the worker, workers engaged in manufacture and the handicraftsman, whom it concentrates in large masses at one spot and directly commands, capital also sets another army in motion by means of invisible threads. And he talks about outworkers in the domestic industries. The organization of many, many separate domestic industries into a system of production under the command of capital became a very important aspect of industrial organization in the 19th century. If you look, for example, at what happened in to industry in Paris during the Second Empire, you don't see an increase of factory production. Factory production actually goes way out either to the suburbs or goes to places like Saint-Étienne, Lille, Mulhouse, and the like. But industrial production inside of Paris proliferated immensely during the Second Empire, and it proliferated by exactly this mechanism he's talking about here. The organization of domestic industries into a very sophisticated system of capitalist production under command of merchant capitalists who were orchestrating what was happening. <coughs> My favorite example of this would be the production of, uh, of artificial flowers, which was one of the big industries of Paris at the time. Artificial flowers. In the 1840s you find workshops that were just specializing on one kind of flower. By the time you get to 1850s, 1860s, you find workshops that are specializing on one kind of stamen, or workshops that are specializing on on one kind of petal, or something like that. And they're all being put together and assembled in a very intricate kind of system. And it's a very intricate sort of putting out system. If you want a very good description of it, you go uh, of this contrast, by the way, between the industrial system and, and this domestic system, you read Zola's La Sommoir, where in fact what you'll find there, these, there's, there's, there's a description of a mechanical monster kind of factory uh, which is now making bolts, it's machines making machines, as it were, 
At the same time, there's a there's an intricate description of this couple in its in its workshop residence, at the top of a house, which is which is which is making gold thread wire. And each month, uh, the merchant comes with a certain amount of gold, and then comes at the end of the month and takes the wire back, and is very very, you know pushy about exactly how much wire has been made in relationship to the amount of gold that's been given. And, and uh, these people were working day in and day out, uh, just making this, this wire in this, in this system, which is going into the jewelry trade. These systems of production became very common in the 19th, in 19th century, but they never went away. And as I think I mentioned earlier, uh, one of the big problems I think that Marx has here is his tendency to think that the factory system is going to actually drive everything else out. But actually, if you look at the Japanese auto industry in the 1980s, a lot of it was actually erected on uh, an assembly line of components which were made basically in people's attics. I mean, they had a whole domestic system, uh, which in fact was one of the big strengths of the Japanese system because the costs of any kind of downturn wasn't visited on the car companies, it was visited on this kind of mass of, mass of people who were producing the component parts who suddenly didn't have orders for the component parts. So actually, that system worked extremely well for Japanese capital vis-a-vis, -vis, for example, <coughs> Detroit capital, which was very much based on, on, on a more integrated system with large-scale large component parts manufacturers, uh, where you, you, you couldn't do these, kind, these kinds of things. So, the domestic system that he's talking about here, and these invisible threads which are controlling this domestic system, become very important to look at in any industrial organization. And if you go to contemporary Hong Kong, you'll see it all over the place. Uh, if you go to uh, uh, some, some areas of the Philippines and so on, you'll see it all over the place. And this is a very different labor system, but Marx is talking about it here becoming very different from the manufacturing system itself as it used to be. It is a new kind of manufacturing structure, uh, which Marx is seeing as going on around him, but which he doesn't actually accord great significance to as being, if you like, the centerpiece of, of what the world is going to become like. He even talks here about the significance on 591, a bit down, about the significance of decentralization. Uh, as he says, in the so-called domestic industries, this exploitation is still more shameless than in modern manufacture because the workers' power of resistance declines with their dispersal. You know, when you read the account in Zola's novel, it's very hard to imagine the guy going out and, and getting together with all the other people who are in the jewelry business and, and actually, you know, can't do that almost impossible to know, would not know where to find a lot, of, a lot of those people. So that the dispersal then becomes uh, a significant aspect of it. He then talks a lot, 595 onwards, about modern domestic industry and the horrors that go on there, and of course this is about the lace industry and Marx is again going to quote uh, masses and masses of information uh, from uh, the factory inspectors and, and, and the Employment Commission, Children's Employment Commission uh, reports. Uh, but, and I'm not going to go into that, but um, go to 602. <coughs> Where Marx comes back to the idea of, well, how did the machine system arise out of the manufacturing? And in the middle there, he talks about this, the revolution in the social mode of production, which is the necessary product of the revolution in the means of production, is accomplished through a variegated medley of transitional forms. So he's very interested in these transitional forms. But then, on 603, he makes what is a, a very blanket statement, about ten lines down, he says, the variety of these transitional forms does not, however, conceal the tendency operating to transform them into the factory system proper. So this is his argument, you know, there's almost a teleological argument here that the whole system is going to become uh, 
like, uh, like the factory system, uh, and I think there's very good reasons to say that he was, uh, he was wrong about that. Um, then there's some, some great stuff about uh, sewing machines and so on. But then on 604 he makes a, another very interesting point. When he says, the Industrial Revolution, which advances naturally and spontaneously, is also helped on artificially by the extension of the Factory Acts to all industries. Now again, this is a very interesting phenomenon that it's worthwhile following up historically. To what degree has regulation and regulatory systems, have they actually contributed to the increasing centralization of capital? and the increasing concentration of capital. Because a lot of those regulatory regimes become very hard for small producers to bear. So at some point, and Marx actually makes the point here, at some point capitalists think, this is a great idea. Regulate it. We can, we can take on the regulation. They can't. This gives us a competitive advantage through the state apparatus we can drive them out of business simply by imposing upon them rules and regulations that they can't, cannot possibly accede to. So here too we see that there's a sort of a counterintuitive result. You would think the factory would actually help workers, but actually what it does is it helps big capital. In particular, the Factory Acts help big capital, not necessarily the workers. As he says on 607, very explicitly, But though the Factory Acts thus artificially ripen the material elements necessary for the conversion of the manufacturing system into the factory system, Yet at the same time, because they make it necessary to lay out a greater amount of capital, they hasten the decline of the small masters and the concentration of capital. And then goes on to talk about irregular habits of workers and, 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 and so on. In 608 he has another kind of interesting point. A lot of demand for products is seasonal. How does a system adjust to seasonal demand? And, well, one of the answers is, of course, uh, to introduce a certain periodicity uh, into the labor process itself, uh, but also he anticipates something which became very, Im very important in more recent times when he starts to talk about the way in which the adaptability of the system depends upon adequate communication. So on 608 he talks about the habit of giving such orders becomes more frequent with the extension of railways and telegraphs. The extension of the railway system throughout the country has tended very much to encourage, encourage giving short notice. Purchases now come up from Glasgow, Manchester and Edinburgh once every fortnight or so. So in, instead of from buying a stock as they used to, they buy directly. Years ago we were always able to work in the slack time so as to meet the demand of the next season, but now no one can say beforehand what will be in demand then. So you get overworked during the season, underwork other times, but also you get the emergence of a kind of almost just-in-time system that, that capitalists, not wanting to keep great stocks, start to use the new structures of communication and start to use the new structures of transportation to introduce something akin to what we now call a just-in-time system. That is, a kind of flow of commodities which goes very fast when you need it in the season and then slacks off. So actually, this again introduces more volatility into, into the labor process over a period of a year. This uh, 
problem of volatility of seasonal unemployment, for example, in 19th century Paris was a really uh, big, big problem for uh, the health and well-being of much of the population, and uh, part of the year, a large chunk of the working class literally was starved, or stole, or did something like that in order to live, in order to be well enough to go into high-intensity labor when the season came round, and they were, they were needed, in which case they would be working 80 hours a week. Uh, you know, so they'd be doing that for a short period of time, and then six months a year they would be doing uh, almost nothing. The health and education, I think we better actually stop here and then do the health education clauses and then have a general discussion of the chapter on machinery because it really does warrant some serious debate. So let's, let's pause here and we'll race through the health and the, the, the section 9 and section 10 when we come back. Uh, he starts off by kind of saying, well, you know, this is pretty paltry stuff in, in, in fact, uh, and anyway the capitalists can have all kinds of ways uh, to go around it. Uh, but then uh, on 6.13, 14, 6.14, he kind of says, well, at least the Factory Acts acknowledge that there is some role for education, and therefore it opens up the question of what this education is about. And he says on 6.14, he quotes Robert Owen, uh, positively, I think, uh, it's shown us in detail the germ of the education of the future is present in the factory system. This education will, in the case of every child over a given age, combine productive labor with instruction and gymnastics, not only as one of the methods of adding to the efficiency of production, but as the only method of producing fully developed human beings. Now this is a pretty strong statement, and of course he's siding with, with uh, uh, Robert Owen and the Owenist uh, vision, uh, about which you know we can discuss and debate, but he's siding with Robert Owen, saying, "Well, we, we we're not going to junk the factory system. What we'd have to do is we have to actually transcend it in some way, but exactly how is not clear from this." He then contrasts that idea, that socialist idea, with. Uh, the fact that the worker is a living appendage of the machine, and that uh, this is, you know, this is, uh, uh, you know, the, the appalling nature of the actual system uh, that we're concerned with. But then, what then follows is is a a, a whole series of, of remarks which add up, I think, to a suggestion that Marx does not view the factory and the machine alt altogether in a negative light. In fact, it has these positive elements and he's going to build upon that comment on, on Robert Owen in certain ways. And so what are then the positive elements? Uh, first, within the reorganization of the division of labor, he notes something which I think is very important for us to note. Uh, and this is on 616 in the middle. Uh, when he's contrasting old form labor processes which have been transmitted over the generations from one generation to another by word of mouth and by uh, sort of example, and he says it is characteristic of this situation that right down to the 18th century, the different trades were called mysteries, mystères, into whose secrets none but those initiated by their profession and their practical experience could penetrate. Large-scale industry tore aside the veil that concealed from men their own social, own social process of production and turned the various spontaneously divided branches of production into riddles, not only to outsiders but even to the initiated. Its principle, which is to view each process of production in and for itself, and to resolve it into its constituent elements without looking first at the ability of the human hand to perform the new processes, brought into existence the whole of the modern science of technology. The varied, apparently unconnected and petrified forms of the social production process were now dissolved into conscious and planned applications of natural science, divided up systematically in accordance with a particular useful effect aimed at in each case. 
Similarly, technology discovered the few grand fundamental forms of motion which, despite all the diversity of the instruments used, apply necessarily to every productive action of the human body. Just as the science of mechanics is not misled by the immense complication of modern machinery, interviewing this as anything other than the constant reappearance of the same simple mechanical process. Modern industry never views or treats the existing form of a production process as a definitive one. Its technical basis is therefore revolutionary, whereas all earlier modes of production were essentially conservative. By means of machinery, chemical processes and other methods, it is continually transforming not only the technical basis of production, but also the functions of the worker and the social combinations of the labour process. It revolutionizes the division of labour within society, incessantly throws masses of capital and of workers from one branch of production to another. Large-scale industry by very its nature necessitates variation of labour, fluidity of functions, and the mobility of the worker in all directions. But on the other hand, in its capitalist form, it reproduces the old division of labour with its ossified particularities. We have seen how this absolute contradiction does away with all repose, all fixity, and all security as far as the worker's life situation is concerned. How it constantly threatens by taking away the instruments of labour to snatch from his hands the means of subsistence, and by suppressing his specialised function to make him superfluous. So this is about the reckless squandering of labour powers, the devastating effects of social anarchy. This is the negative side. But if, at present, variation of labour imposes itself after the manner of an overpowering natural law, and with a blindly destructive action of a natural law that meets with obstacles everywhere, large-scale industry, through its very catastrophes, makes the recognition of variation of labour, and hence of the fitness of the worker for the maximum number of different kinds of labour, into a question of life and death. This possibility of varying labour must become a general law of social production and the existing relations must be adapted to permit its realisation in practice. That monstrosity, the disposable working population held in reserve, in misery for the changing requirements of capitalist exploitation, must be replaced by the individual man who is absolutely available for the different kinds of labour required of him. The partially developed individual who is merely the bearer of one specialised social function must be replaced by the totally developed individual for whom the different social functions are different modes of activity <coughs> he takes up in turn. Now what do we make of this? There's a negative, there's a positive. You can say, well, you know, Marx is having his cake and eating it <laughs> here. What's the relationship between this negative and this positive? He's plainly seeing a lot going on inside of the industrial capitalist system which has immense potentiality for human emancipation down the, down the way. And the big question is, well, you know, how do you think about mobilizing what he's seeing as positive? The other way you can think about it is to say, to what degree is he actually pinning down a major, con a major contradiction within the history of capitalism? Which is, on the one hand, you want workers who are kind of idiots, who just kind of trained guerrillas, if you like, who can't think, who won't think and don't think, who are not active subjects. At the same time, the development of the capitalist system demands a kind of labour force which is pretty flexible, which is at least partially educated, which can actually respond to new instructions and new situations very rapidly, and which must therefore, to some degree or other, be able to think for itself. So this is a dilemma, actually, around the whole history of public education in, in capitalist social order. And how that contradiction is resolved has indeed been one of the big, if you like, social stories of what capitalism been, has been about worldwide. And you can see that right now. I mean, in this country people are moaning on about the fact we don't have people who know enough math and science, and my God, look at those Chinese, they've got, all, they've got millions of them. <laughs> and how we're becoming uncompetitive. And so part of the bourgeoisie and part of the capitalist class is out there saying, we have to improve 
education and math and sciences and engineering because otherwise we're messed. Actually, they've done all right in the past, they let the Russians train, train them, and then, you know, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, they all came here. They let the Chinese train them, they let Indians train them, and then they, you know, just imported them. So, and actually they trained them for free, that's the great thing. The United States did not have to pay the cost of their education, let the Indians pay for it, the Chinese pay for it, the Russians pay for it, we won't pay for it, we'll just take the skilled labour, the very sophisticated skilled labour, and we'll bring it in. So that's one of the ways in which you can resolve this, this particular dilemma. But now people are beginning to get worried because actually a lot of the Chinese who they thought were going to stay here have gone back to China because they get better jobs in China than they get here, so what are you going to do with, with, with that, kind of, that kind of problem? So, the, but the, so the, the point that I think that Marx is making is that there is a fundamental contradiction for capitalism here. And that fundamental contradiction opens up some possibilities for radical thought and radical, po radical ways of, of working. And it turns out that, of course, that issue, which is, you know, at the heart of university education, you know, university education these days, in its neoliberal guise, is not to meant to put you in courses like this. It's meant to train you to be good, thoughtful people around, you know, engineering, social, you know, good neoliberal kinds of uh, theorists and, and activists. But at the same time, the trouble is that when people get in, they start to think for themselves, and what are you going to do about that? Well, you can repress and you can do all those sorts of things. This is a dilemma actually many societies have had, and I think that what Marx is pointing to is the dilemma, and I think that's correct to look at it. On the other hand, I have a certain discomfort with the way in which he's kind of saying, well, you know, it's, the, the factory system's okay, out of that's going to come, you know, if we only have gymnastics and all those kinds of things, everything will be okay. I mean, that's what the Soviet Union believed, and actually, of course, that's how, how Japanese uh, workforce is organized too, you know, calisthenics before you go in and cheerleading and all those kinds of things. So this, it, it's, it, it, it's a bit bothersome what he's, what he's saying here, but you can sort of see where, where he's coming from. But also, this other Marxist principle you have is here kicking in with a vengeance, which is that no society can set itself tasks to which it does not already have at hand certain solutions. So we just can't go to Mars and hope that we'll find solutions on Mars, we have to find them in our society, in the here and now. And so what Marx is willing to do here is to look inside the factory system and to look for solutions inside of the contemporary factory system, as he saw it at that time. And I think he's inviting us to do the same sort of thing. And, and, and you know, how you think about that is, you know, is a big, is, is, is a big political question. Uh, but this is where, where he is certainly at. This leads on to an argument on 619, where again, this is one of the rare places he does this in Capital, he says, the Factory Act, the first meagre concession wrung from capital, is limited to combining elementary education with work in the factory. There can be no doubt that, with the inevitable conquest of political power by the working class, technological education, both theoretical and practical, will take its proper place in the schools of the workers. There is also no doubt that those revolutionary ferments whose goal is the abolition of the old division of labour stand in diametrical contradiction with the capitalist form of production and the economic situation of the workers which corresponds to that form. However, the development of the contradictions of a given historical form of production is the only historical way in which it can be dissolved and then reconstructed on a new basis. In other words, these are the contradictions with which you have to work, if you want to construct an alternative kind of society. Again, there's not much in Capital which tells you about Marx's theory of revolution, this is a brief kind of synopsis. Then he continues in this vein on the next page, 620, when he starts to talk about the economic family, the economic foundation of the family. 
And he says at the top there that large-scale industry, in overturning the economic foundation of the old family system and the family labour corresponding to it, had also dissolved old family relationships. Then he goes on to talk about, you know, what's happening to parents, and, and uh, what transformed parental power into its misuse, which he's talked about earlier in, uh, in that kind of family labour kind of stuff. But then he goes on to say, however terrible and disgusting the dissolution of the old family ties within the capitalist system may appear, large-scale industry, by assigning an important part in socially organized processes of production, outside the sphere of the domestic economy, to women, young persons and children of both sexes, does nevertheless create a new economic foundation for a higher form of the family and of relations between the sexes. Again, a negative is suddenly converted into a positive. And he then says further on in that paragraph, it is also obvious that the fact that the collective working group is composed of individuals of both sexes and all ages must, under the appropriate conditions, turn into a source of humane development. Although in its spontaneously developed brutal capitalist form, the system works in the opposite direction, and becomes a pestiferous source of corruption and slavery. <coughs> so, in these sections, what we're getting is an account of the misery of the system, but also something about what Marx sees as the possibilities within it. And then what follows up is a real account of the misery of the system, which is mainly about you know, what it's like down the mines and, and, and how that all works and, and so on. I'm not going to go over that. <coughs> um, the, the end of this section he then says on 635, If this a general extension of factory legislation to all trades for the purpose of protecting the working class, both in mind and body, has become inevitable. On the other hand, as we already pointed out, that extension hastens on the general conversion of numerous isolated small industries into a few combined industries carried on upon a large scale. It therefore accelerates the concentration of capital and the exclusive predominance of the factory system. And he then talks about destroying the ancient and transitional forms, but by doing this it also generalizes the direct struggle against its rule. While in each individual workshop it enforces uniformity, regularity, order and economy, the result of the immense impetus given to technical, technical improvement by the limitation and regulation of the working day is to increase the anarchy and the proneness to catastrophe of capitalist production as a whole bottom of the page, by maturing the material conditions of the social combination of the processes of production, it matures the contradictions and antagonisms of the capitalist form of that process, and thereby ripens both the elements for forming a new society and the forces tending towards the overthrow of the old one. Again, he's emphasizing the contradictory character of this, its instability, its volatility, its, its anarchy, its awfulness, but at the same time talking about the ways in which we might look for revolutionary transformation out of that system, not by going outside of it, but by going inside of it to see what is going on there, thinking about things like automation and so on. And you can see, in some ways, reading these passages where a lot of the philosophy of the Soviet Union came from. That is, what you're trying to do is not undo the factory system. You're trying to find those elements within it which are potentially liberatory. So the Soviets concentrated immensely on things like automation, robotization, all the rest of it. Uh, and they sought paths of technological change down in, 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 that, in that direction. They also sought to, if you like, instantiate the factory system and education alongside of it, a highly developed educational system alongside of it, which was technical education. 
which explains why it is that if you go to certain, I remarked this one time when I, I went to the, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope uh, uh, building at uh, Johns Hopkins, which is where all of the great uh, mathematical whizzes are on uh, uh, astronomy, cosmology, and all the rest of it. And uh, you go sit down at the table there, and the lingua franca in the, in the dining room is Russian. How do anybody speaks English in the place? It's it's uh, it, 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 it's Russians in exile who've been brought over, and 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 have the skills and the and and and, and the ability to do this stuff which uh, a lot of us uh, don't have. So let's just look quickly then at the last piece, which is large scale industry and agriculture. Marx is interested in section ten and what's the relationship between this industrial system and the relation to nature in effect, through agriculture. Uh, again, he has some real possibilities here. He says uh, on 637, well, on the one hand, we've got technological application of science, uh, which replaces the irrational and slothful traditional way of working. Uh, it uh, produces all these revolutions, but at the same time it creates the material conditions for a new and higher synthesis, a union of agriculture and industry on the basis of the forms that have developed during the period of their antagonistic isolation. On the other hand, it concentrates the historical motive power of society, disturbs the metabolic interaction between man and the earth, prevents the return to the soil of its constituent elements consumed by man in the form of food and clothing. Hence it hinders the operation of the eternal natural condition for the lasting fertility of the soil. goes on in the next pages, it transforms the metabolism, uh, and, and, and uh, uh, as he says uh, right at the end, capitalist production therefore only develops the techniques and the degree of combination of the social process of production by simultaneously undermining the original sources of all wealth, the soil and the worker. That is. The dynamic of capitalism moves towards the degradation of the worker and the degradation of the environment. And these two things go hand in hand. This is a proposition, by the way, that was taken up uh, very forcefully by Karl Polanyi in The Great Transformation. So if you ever get to read that book, you'll, you'll find him, you know, Karl Polanyi is basically saying, capitalist system, absolute, I mean, he wrote it in 1944 or 5, so he never cited Marx, but he's obviously quoting Marx in a lot of this when he still talks about the way in which capitalism, left to its own devices, unregulated, is likely to generate depletion of the labour supply and destruction of the soil. Okay, so I've whizzed through this chapter on machinery and large-scale industry. I'd like now to reflect on it and get your, some of your thoughts about it. It's a complicated chapter for the reasons I've suggested, which is First off, the, the dynamics are not always clear as to which way Marx is going, in terms of how do we understand the machine, how do we understand the factory. Is it positive and negative? It's positive, it's negative, you know, and what, uh, what are we to attribute to social relations and what are we to attribute to technology? There's a sort of dialogue going on on the technology social relations front and the relation to nature front as well at the end here. The dialogue there which I think has all kinds of problematics in it, unless you look at it also from the standpoint of what the revolutionary possibilities are inside of this distinctively capitalistic system, because here he's dealing with the capitalistic mode of production in its full-fledged form and in all of its splendor, as it were, and all of its horrors. So what are we going to make of that? How are we going to utilize that? <laughs> Uh, as part of a transitional kind of process to a socialist society becomes part of the question that he's involved in, which I think accounts for the way in which he starts to set up these negative, positive uh, arguments uh, towards the end, end of the chapter. Um, I'm going to push ahead here. I suggested you read the chapter on absolute and relative surplus value. I, should, I would do that. Um, we'll do, we'll, we'll, do a brief commentary on that next time. I'm not going to really talk about chapters 17 and 18. Uh, all Marx does there is sort of uh, consolidate his formula, and I think 
This is a point where he, he's, he seems to be nervous about the fact that people haven't quite got his point, so he sort of repeats it all uh, in, in slightly different ways. And, uh, and so it's, they're not, they're not uh, terribly informative. The whole section on wages, again, I'm not going to talk about them, um, but just, just to sort of briefly mention them. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's really about just the wages system, and, it, and it's fairly self-evident and obvious, and we'll talk about it very briefly. But I really want to do, next time, chapters 23 and chapter 24. Okay? And I want you to pay particular attention to the, um, uh, the sort of uh, introductory page and a half on, on uh, introduces part seven. It's a very important thing, but I want to take chapters 22. So read, read the other stuff and we'll just talk very briefly about, about it. You should be able to go through the rest of that, that stuff pretty easily. But we start to get into some very interesting and very important stuff in chapters 23 and 24. So I want to concentrate on chapters 23 and 24 uh, for next time.